Thanks, mate. Who is Stu? Where do you come from? Hello, everyone. Where did you live when you were a little tacker? When I was a little tacker, well, I'm going to yeah, share. Li- yeah, I, I'm going to share a little bit of that story when um, I share this morning. But I'm uh, predominantly from the Sutherland Shire uh, in Sydney, and if you haven't heard of the Sutherland Shire, you might have heard of Cronulla Sharks. So go the Sharks. Although last night we didn't 50, go real good. Yeah, yeah I know, like I know. 50 yeah. or 48 nil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my burden. So, yeah. <laughs> but we've won one grand final and that's enough for me. So, uh, It's roosted territory here in this building, or it was when Tim was around. <laughs> Anyhow, um, that's how I got a job here. I went for the roosters. Um, uh, how'd you grow up? Where'd you grow up? Just... Briefly, yeah, just briefly, and again, I'm going to share a little bit because yep. it's part of my journey um, that's led me to think through what John was talking about this morning about our heart. And um, but yeah, basically, I lived in Guymy Bay in Sutherland Shire. Uh, I now live in Grace Point, and I can see Guymy Bay from where I live, so I haven't moved very far. But in between moving between Guymy Bay and Grace Point, I lived in Narandra for a few years too, down near Griffith and Wagga Wagga. Okay. Um, did you grow up in a Christian family? Um, yes, yeah. So my mum, my story is that my mum and dad uh, weren't Christians when they went to have me christened as a child back in 1968. It was still so socially the thing you did. You got your kid done, as my father would say. But as he went to get me done to be christened, my mum and dad became Christians as they talked to the minister. And the story goes that my mum and dad kneeled on either side of the bed after talking to the minister and put their hands together and very solemnly prayed a sinner's prayer and gave their lives to Jesus. And apparently my dad, who's from Yorkshire, and my mum, who's from Sutherland Shire, uh, apparently looked at each other and dad said, do you feel any different? And she said, no. Do you feel any different? He said, no. So apparently they got into bed and read a book. But after after <laughs> that, um, they, they were very excited about their Christian faith. So I got brought up in a family where two people had just become Christians. So they were youth leaders and Sunday school very leaders. Very exciting stuff. So yeah, for me growing up as a young Christian boy, I was very excited, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember a time when I wasn't following Jesus. So, yeah, that's excellent, mate. Just quickly before I hand over, because mm. we'll try and catch time up. But yep. what's been exciting you about ministry where you are at the moment this year? Yeah, well, I, I'm a rector of uh, Anglican Church in Sydney. We're a church plant, and our church is called Soul Revival Church. And I'll tell you a little bit about that story. Why we've chose a different name for our Anglican Church plant. We're in Kirrawee, which is near Guymere Bay, uh, as well as being the rector of Soul Revival Church. I'm also the chaplain to the Cronulla Sharks. And the thing that's exciting me at the moment is uh, there's a man named Jason Bakuya who's now moved to Dubbo. And Jason and his wife, Ronnie, uh, were leading a ministry amongst the Sharks players called the Iron Squad. And we started that group in 2016, which was a really good year. And 2016, they, um, they won the grand final. And there was... There was a number of NRL players that joined the Iron Squad and they uh, did Bible study together and I had the privilege of being part of that. And what's exciting me this year is that Jason's retired from NRL but two young players from the Sharks approached me last couple of weeks ago and said, Stewie, I think it's time we get the Iron Squad going. So pray for for uh, Britt and Leone, uh, uh, Sione rather, sorry. A uh, bit tired by the way today. If I, I mix up a few things, I got in here last night at 1.30. So I was I was working yesterday at Gaimi and drove all the way up here last night. So I'm a bit tired. But um, anyway, those two young boys have got apparently eight boys from the Sharks who want to join the Iron Squad. And so, yeah, pray for the NRL, the Christians in the NRL because there's a, a lot of great ministry going on there. So um, I might pray and then begin. So let's uh, bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together in in, uh, this wonderful opportunity to think through Indigenous ministry together. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bring us together, that we'd be able to sit and think about what a difference Jesus has made for us, that he has reconciled us to you through the cross and he's reconciled us to each other. We thank you for that wonderful miracle. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm very humbled to have the opportunity to share this weekend and I'd like to thank George for the invitation to come and speak. I've known George for about 20 years and the family and um, I'm going to share a little bit of my story today because it actually is a really nice segue off the back of uh, what John was saying about our hearts that I think the, uh, the, the, the concepts that we're going to be thinking about today do have to come from our heart. And I wanted to share with you just briefly uh, how my heart has 
changed over the years. Because as I said just uh, briefly, I grew up in the Sutherland Shire. And the Sutherland Shire is not known to be a very diverse area. It's a very Anglo-Celtic area and there's been uh, a lot of um, uh, people from English background who've uh, moved into the Sutherland Shire, some from an Italian background. We used to have some beautiful Italian tomato farms in Caringbar. You may or may not have heard about that and there's a bit of heritage of uh, Italian heritage. But growing up, um, I would go to school in primary school and I would notice, this is back in the 1970s, and I would notice that we were being taught about Aboriginal people um, and that um, the first arrival of Captain Cook was at Botany Bay, which is in the Sutherland Shire. And we'd be taught about the story of first contact between Aboriginal people, the Dharawal people and, and the British, and we'd hear these stories and I'd look around, I remember as a child looking around my classroom saying, where are they? Where are all the Dharawal people? Why aren't they here in my classroom with me? If this is where the British and the Dharawal people first met, where are the Dharawal people now? And I had a nagging uh, concern about that as a young child because I was surrounded by white faces and white surnames and white stories. Well, in the late 1970s, my father, who was a, uh, an accountant with the uh, National Australia Bank, got a move to Narandra. And my story was the opposite of Jum's story that we heard where he came to the beach for the first time and got caught in a rip. I'd never been in a river. And so I've been just surfing as a young boy and I had my bronze medallion down at the surf club and I was very familiar with rips and I was very familiar with the salt water, but I wasn't very familiar with fresh water. And when my dad said that we were moving to Narandra, I thought he said Miranda. <laughs> and Miranda is a suburb in the Southern Shire. So I wasn't worried because I'm like, oh, the thing that I used to live for in those days was the beach. And I'm like, well, that's okay. If we move to Miranda, that's even closer to the beach and I don't have to go as far. That's only 10 minutes away, not 15 minutes away from Cronulla. Well, it was a long way away from Cronulla. And then my mum explained to me that Narandra was eight hours away from the beach. And apparently I went and locked myself in my room and cried. I was only 10 years old when I went to Narandra. And it was a bit of a culture shock. But there was a delightful surprise for me when I walked into Narandra public school for the first time. Because I wasn't just surrounded by white faces. I looked around and I saw Aboriginal young people. And there was something in me that felt really happy about that. But that was only a short-lived ex experience because at recess, or little lunch, whatever we used to call it at Narendra Public School, I went out into the yard and I was playing with the Aboriginal kids and the non-Aboriginal kids out in the yard. There was uh, Celtic Anglo kids and Aboriginal kids and I did something wrong. I can't remember to this day what it was. I was trying to think as I was driving up, what was it that I did wrong? But I don't remember. There was something I did wrong. A social faux pas. And everyone chased me. All the, 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 the white kids and the Aboriginal kids, they were all chasing me and I was running for my life because they said they were going to bash me and I was running around and there was, there was um, all these kids chasing me around and it felt like an eternity as I ran around the playground. And I remember those old monkey bars. Do you remember those, those monkey... You wouldn't see them in a school today, would you? I mean, probably one kid a week broke their arm on those things. But anyway, I ran for the monkey bars in the sand pit and for some reason I ended up falling over into the sand and they all piled on top of me. And I thought oh, this was the end of my life. And I was lying there in the sand thinking, I just want to go home to Gaimi. <laughs> this is a scary place. But after we had a wrestle, I found out it wasn't that bad. We all just had a wrestle and then we went into class again. Anyway, I went into class and what was terrific about that run around uh, experience was a young boy um, whose name was Gary came and sat next to me. And he said, you can run fast for a white fella. We are all real impressed. And I went, oh, really? I'm a bit scared of what happened there. I feel a bit nervous and I've still got sand in my ear. <laughs> and he said, nah, you run real good for a white fella. Do you want to play, do you want to play on our AFL team? And I said, what's AFL? <laughs> well, it was, called, it was called something different back then, wasn't it? It wasn't called Australian. What was it called? VFL it was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because Narandra is down near the border with uh, Victoria. They used to call the Victorians Mexicans, which I didn't understand for many years. They do, do they? Yeah, yeah. I didn't understand that for a long time. Anyway, so my young friend Gary and I became really good friends. And after a, what I thought was a rough start, and I think they were all just testing me out. I think they just wanted to see who this city boy was. And I became really good friends with, with all the kids in that, in that year group. We were really good friends. And one of the things that Gary taught me was a love for the river. 
And I'd never been to the river before and I, I was explaining to Gary one day at lunchtime and I said, look, I really miss the ocean. I really miss going for a swim. And he said, well, there's a whole bunch of us going out for, we're going to ride our bikes out to One Mile uh, Beach. I said, a beach? You have a beach? <laughs> he said, it's not like your beach. <laughs> it's different to Cronulla Beach. But come out to the beach and we'll go to the Murrumbidgee River. And I remember riding out with my young brother, who was two years younger than me. We rode out to the river, the Murrumbidgee River, and there we were, Aboriginal kids and non-Aboriginal kids all swimming in the river together. And there was something that was delighting my soul about that. It's something that I'd missed, even when I was in Guayami, hearing about the stories of Aboriginal people. And I'm, I'm now friends with... I felt sort of more whole somehow as a little kid. But I will tell you one thing I did wrong. Uh, the Murrumbidgee River was in flood the first time we went there and there was a big old gum tree that went right, big river, old red river gum that went out over the, the river and the, and the boys told me what you do is you climb up onto that big branch and then you jump into the river and when you go into the river you, you go under the water but you come up about six metres down river because it's running so fast. But they said the danger is there might be some logs or twigs that have come down river and it might be a snare so it's a bit dangerous. So when they told me that, I was trying to impress everyone. I said, oh, what we'll do is we'll get my brother Greg to jump in first and if he comes up, we'll know it's safe. So my brother, who was eight, <laughs> climbed up the tree because, of course, he wanted to show off and he got up on the tree, jumped into the river to the cheers of everyone on the riverbank and I remember waiting patiently, is he going to come up? And then his little, little head came up and he floated to the... Oh, we all got up and we swam in the river, so that was safe. Boy, did I get in trouble off my mum that day when I told her what I'd done. I was quite proud of myself. But um, that was a really lovely experience. We'd go fishing, we'd go hunting for yabbies. Um, I don't know how you hunt yabbies, but my Aboriginal friend Gary taught me to get a tin can and tie a string on it and put a soap in the middle of the can and put some holes in it and throw that into the river over the bubbles, where the bubbles were. And then we'd light a fire on the riverbank and we'd sit there for, for ages, catching yabbies, cooking them, eating them. And when my dad said it was time to go back to the Shire after three years in Narendra, I locked myself in my room and I cried again because I didn't want to go. And you know who came to see me off at the airport? There was one boy who came and saw me off at the airport, Gary. And as, it, as I left, he said, don't you forget about me, Stu. Don't forget about me. And he said, by the way, I think you run real fast for a white fella. <laughs> and I gave him a hug, I remember. We're outside the motel. And then we got on in the car and went off to the airport. When I came back to the Sutherland Shire, I was back amongst white faces again. And it seemed strange. didn't feel right. But in God's providence, in my geography class in year 10 at Kirrawee High School, I sat next to a young Aboriginal girl called Larissa Barrent. And Larissa and I sat in geography. And I uh, used to love talking to Larissa about her family and her her, her her past and she'd teach me more about Aboriginal culture and I was a bit naive and Larissa was very patient and she was very gracious to me because when I'd sit with Larissa in geography I remember one particular day to my shame I said to Larissa isn't it great that we came to Australia and she turned to me and she looked at me and she said what do you mean it's great that you came to Australia I said Larissa think of all the great things that we've brought to Australia and she looked at me and with a wry smile, she said, name me one thing that you white fellas have brought to Australia. Because she's this young Aboriginal girl. And I said, Panadol? That's good. <laughs> and I remember she looked at me and she said, Stuart, you're an idiot. <laughs> and Larissa actually spoke to me about the past. And, and she'd tell me uh, at that recess, instead of running around the playground, she was telling me about what happened to her people and where they'd gone. And she told me about how my ancestors had come to this place and taken the land off the people, how many of them got sick and died. She told me about the Aboriginal fish traps down at Grace Point, which I thought was just a rock wall that someone had built, but apparently it was her ancestors who built that fish trap off Grace Point. And in a river that used to be filled with the laughter and games and the fun of Aboriginal children, now there were just fishing boats of the white people that were going up and down. I felt sorry. She told me about the massacres. She told me about how unjustly her people had been treated. And I still think back to this day of my comment about Panadol with shame. And I kept saying to her over and over, Larissa, I'm so sorry. 
And one day she said, Stuart, you've got to stop saying sorry so much. <laughs> you've said sorry. It's enough. But I must admit, when I left high school, I felt like I knew more about what had happened in our country. And I had such a deep heart for my friend Gary and Larissa and the Aboriginal people, but I didn't know what to do. Well, when I started out side of um, Kirrawee High School, I went to university and I studied political science at the University of Sydney. And while I was at the University of Sydney, uh, I was given the opportunity by my minister at Guymi Anglican Church to start a youth group. Now, the problem of our youth in the Sutherland Shire was that they didn't want to go to church anymore. There was a time in the 1960s that the young people at uh, the Sutherland Shire would all go to church. And apparently at Guymer Anglican Church, you just needed to open the Sunday school doors and 400 children would walk in through the door. But by the time I was at Guymer Anglican Church, I can say with honesty today that all of the young people I grew up with at Guymer Anglican Church actually left Guymer Anglican Church when they turned 18. And so many of them went up the pub instead of going to another church that they used to call the local pub at North Cronulla Hotel, Northies they used to call it going to church on Sunday. And my friends who were in my soccer team who used to go to church and they used to go to the Sunday night youth service would say to each other after soccer, oh, are you going to church this week? I'll see you up at church. And I knew they meant northies. And it used to break my heart. And despite that, my wife and I, who were uh, very young, I was only 21, uh, 22 when I married my wife Louise, who just turned 20, and Louise and I were asked by the minister, would you start a youth group at Guymer Anglican? And like I said, my experience had been that all the young people had left our church. And so we said, yes, we'll do that. But we want to be a youth group if we start it. We want it to be for everyone, not just for kids who come to church. Because you see, when we used to go to church, all the kids who came to church were from church families. And they'd all grown up in those church families. And I think that I'm not far wrong in suggesting that most of the kids who came to our church youth group only came because their parents made them come. And the reason they'd gone to Northies afterwards was because when they had their own opportunity to make their own free choice, they left and they went to another church, which wasn't a Christian church. It was, it was the pub. And I said to the minister when he said, would you be willing to restart the youth group, by which time had dwindled down to almost nothing, maybe 15 kids from a height of those years before the 60s when there'd be 400. Now there's maybe 10, 15 kids of church families. I said, I will run, I'd be happy to run the youth group as long as I'm allowed to make it for everybody, not just for the kids who come to church from church families. And when I told him that, he was fine with it. But I remember one uh, older lady at our church and she said, you are so naive, young man. I've never seen a kid from a non-church family come to our church. You are so naive to think that you'll ever see any young people from outside of this church come to this church. And I remember thinking, well, that's not what I hear Jesus talk about. I loved my elder because she taught me Sunday school, but she'd become a bit cynical. She'd become uh, a bit trapped by the past. She expected the future would look like what the past looked like. But I want to draw our attention this morning to Matthew twenty two thirty seven to 40. Because when Jesus is asked by the Pharisees what is the most important thing, he says something that helps us to be liberated from our past and to be thinking of the future. You see, the Pharisees were trying to capture Jesus. They were men of the past. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the time of Jesus and they were trying to control the people with all their rules and regulations and what they thought was normal. But we know, don't we, that Jesus had come from heaven, that Jesus was fully man and fully God. And when they tried to trap him, he said this to them in verse 37 of Matthew 22. He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. I was reading that at the time when I first became a youth leader, and I was very convicted by it. Because when I thought about that, that's, that teaching of Jesus, I thought to myself, I don't know if I actually do love God with all of my heart and my soul and my mind. I feel like I just give God what's left over after I've done all the other things in my life. Sure, I go to church on Sunday night. 
I go to Bible study and I lead youth group. But honestly, if I've got an essay due at university, I'll ring up my Bible study leader and say, sorry, I'm a bit busy this week. I can't get there because I've got to do my, my, uh, my, my uni work. Or if I get a shift from work on a Friday night that conflicts with my youth group leading, I say, oh, look, I'm sorry I can't be there this week because I've got work. And when I go along to church, I realise something else from this teaching of Jesus. When me and my friends go, went to church on Sunday night, it was more like going to the movies than it was going to church. I don't know if you like going to the movies. I used to love going to the movies. I still love a good movie, although I don't seem to watch as many as I used to. But when I go to the movies and I sit in this, room, this dark room full of people and the screen comes on and the movie comes on, I've usually gone to the movies with a small group of friends that I've talked to on the way in and I sit with during the movie and then I talk to on the way out. I don't talk to everybody else in the room. And when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, the second thing follows. Look down there in verse 38. He says, this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So not only was I thinking when I go to the movies that, you know, I'm going to, to see a movie, but I'm not really talking to anybody except for my small group of mates. What I'm really doing at church is a similar kind of thing. Because I haven't given God everything, I'm only thinking of myself when I go to church and I'm looking for people like me. And I sit with them in church and I have good friendships with them but I've kind of not ignored, but I don't see the other people in the room. Because I'm not giving God everything and seeing the whole group of people in the church like he does, I've narrowed in my focus just on myself and what I want and I give God what's left over and I go to church to be with my friends who are like me. But when I give God the whole of my life and I flip it and I think that the action is with the Lord and following him, then I'm going to see everybody because Jesus sees everybody. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on the crowds, didn't he? Wasn't it lovely that when Jesus went and goes and teaches in, in Matthew chapter 5 on the Sermon on the Mount, he goes to teach his disciples, but he doesn't go to the movies just with his disciples to watch the movie and not notice anybody else, because he goes out on the side of a hill on the sea of Gal side of the Sea of Galilee so everyone could come and hear. And the crowds are all there listening to Jesus as he teaches his disciples. And in verse 39, he says, love your neighbour as yourself. And later, when the Pharisees keep trying to push on Jesus, who is your neighbour? Because they were good at that, weren't they? they? They want to narrow down their focus. Jesus told us the story of the Good Samaritan. And if you're familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan, it was a story told by Jesus when he was on this little dirt track on the way from Jericho to Jerusalem, which was a pretty dangerous track in and of itself. But he tells this story of this man who gets taken over by robbers and robbed and left for dead on the side of this little track. And even though a religious leader and other Jews walk past this man who's a Jewish man, they ignore him on the ground because they go to the movies with their friends by themselves. And they've started to only see the people who are important to them, not everybody. Yet, in the story that Jesus tells, the Good Samaritan walks past the man and, and this Samaritan is a natural enemy of the man on the road. See, Samaritan Jews didn't get on very well. A Jew would not have lunch with a Samaritan. They would not sit at the same table. And yet, despite their differences and their long-running feud between their two peoples, the good Samaritan picks up this poor old guy on the side of the road, throws him on his donkey, takes him to the nearest inn, pays for the guy to get looked after. And Jesus says, just like that good Samaritan looked after that Jew, so we should be like that if we put God first. If we don't treat God as as our God and give him what's left over in our life and just look after the people who really are close to us and mean something to us. But if we give God everything in our lives and put him first, then we'll see other people with compassion that he has. And everyone is our neighbour, not just those who are like us. And you know, when that lady at Guymer Anglican Church told me, you're a bit naive to think that kids who aren't Christians would come to a youth group because they're not like us. Even our own kids leave. What, how are the kids who are outside of our group going to come to our group? Well, I remembered Narendra because I was outside of the Narendra group. I'd never swum in fresh water in my life, actually. <coughs> Murrumbidgee River was actually the first time I swam in a river. And yet that group of kids who chased me around that playground 
accepted me and young Gary brought me in and he loved me and I loved him and we were different. Larissa Berent, despite my ignorance, per persevered with me and helped me to come to understand that I needed to recognise what had happened in the past. Not to stay there and think that it will never change, but we've got to start by understanding what's happened and then understand how God himself can change things. But as John said today, it starts in our heart, doesn't it? We have to have a heart for others. And the only way we can have a heart for others is if Jesus teaches us how to have a heart for others. Now, I'm really pleased to say um, in this brief amount of time that because I trusted in the word of Jesus rather than my elder in that instance and stepped out in faith, our little youth group, which actually by the time I started it, had gone down to four kids. We could drive them around in one car. It was a small little youth group. But I decided that I'd start going to Kirawee High School and preaching the gospel of scripture. And within five years of going to the school, our little group of four kids had grown to 500 teenagers and young adults. Seven years probably, sorry, seven years. Within a seven-year period, 500. And 80% of those kids had come from non-church backgrounds. But, you know, as I led that, some people in the Sydney Diocese, because I was a Sydney Anglican youth minister, some people in the Sydney Diocese would say, wow, how exciting is this? But I would look around our group and something made me sad because there were... Not everyone was there. If everyone is our neighbour, sure, all these non-Christian kids who don't usually go to church were here and that was exciting. But they're not all my neighbours. My neighbour are not just white kids. Where are my Aboriginal brothers and sisters? And I used to cry at night to my wife because I said, what happened to the Dharawal people? Why can't we be like in Narendra and all be together? And so my wife and I would pray and we would say, God, please help us to know what your will is. How can we possibly get together as our two peoples? Because we wanted to put God first, my wife and I had stopped only doing church stuff when it suited us. And we had a conviction from a man named Philip Jensen who was teaching at the University of New South Wales because I graduated out of uh, Sydney University and I started a PhD at the University of New South Wales and I moved from Sydney Uni to New South Wales Uni, and I started listening to this man, Pete, uh, Philip Jensen. Sorry, a bit tired today. Philip Jensen taught us that what you've got to do is you've got to find a church and then look for a job and then look for a house. Don't look for a job, find a house, and then get a church. And Lou and I looked at each other and went, well, we found a church, so let's do that. So my wife and I committed under God. We said, look, Lord, we're going to stay at this church at Grimer Anglican until... You tell us to leave and we'll devote the rest of our lives to this church if that's what you want. And so my wife and I decided to go on an adventure. But as we started in our local church, we had a passion to go, well, how are we going to make this a church for everybody, not just for some people? And we'd pray and pray and pray. Well, I've already mentioned that we were teaching scripture and we were teaching scripture by this stage at Kirawee High School and Gaimi High School, and we built a team up now that our youth group had got bigger. And by the early 2000s, uh, one of my assistant youth ministers, Fiona Francisconi, was teaching scripture at Gaimi High School, and a young Aboriginal boy called Douglas Gordon brought his Bible to scripture. A young Aboriginal boy had brought it, what the, and, and Fiona rings me up after school, you're not going to believe it. Not that she's had a young Aboriginal boy in a class, but a boy brought a Bible to Scripture. She thought that was the biggest miracle she'd ever seen because nobody brings a Bible to Scripture in the Solomon Shire. Well, anyway, Douglas had talked to Fiona after the class. She was very interested. Why did you bring a Bible, Douglas? And she said, and, and Douglas Gordon said, well, my mum and dad, Isaac and Eileen Gordon, have become the house parents at Kirinari at Sylvania and we're really lonely because we haven't met any other Christians. And Fiona rang me and said, Douglas has asked us to go around to go and meet them. And I rang my wife, Lou, and I said, Lou, I wonder if Ike might be an answer to prayer. Maybe God's actually going to help us to express being a Christian, not just as white Christians, but together, because everyone's our neighbour. Well, anyway, I went around to Ike and Eileen's place, and Ike told me, brother, I'm glad you came around because we're about to pack up and go home to Brewarina because we've, we've not been able to meet any Christians here and it's too busy, there's too many cars. 
We don't like it down here. <laughs> and I said, well, why don't we hang out and spend time together? I had no idea what that meant. As a white person, what that means to me is that maybe we'll catch up once a week for a coffee or maybe we'll have Bible study or maybe we'll go to church together. That's not what Isaac thought I was inviting him to because I'd be sitting at home watching the TV and all of a sudden Nike would rock up at 10.30 at night and he'd come in and he's like, put the kettle on, brother, and, I, and he'd just come in. And my wife Lou and I were delighted. This is new. We hadn't had this kind of relationship before. And then one night, Isaac came around to my house with a guy called Feli McHughes. And Feli came in and sat with us and we talked for literally four or five hours about the gospel. And Ike rang me the next day and he said, Brother, Feli enjoyed our chat about the gospel. And he said, if you were a fruit tree that produced love, your branches would be hanging on the ground. You had so much fruit. We had such a nice time. Well, we were having great fellowship and we are having great yarns and lots and lots of really fun things we are talking about. But Ike said, Stewie, you've got to come out and meet my people. And I said, what do you mean? He's, you know, your people at Kirinari, like I come to Kirinari. We used to hang out with all the teenagers there. He said, no, come out to Brewarrina. And I said, where's Brewarrina? <laughs> I said, the furthest west I've been is Narendra. He goes, nah, brother, it's a bit further out than Narendra and in the opposite direction. And so we got in our little car and we drove out to Brewarrina with my son Ethan. I hadn't got Elijah at this stage and Louise and I had a wonderful weekend in Brewarrina. And it was the first time we met the Fergusons. We went out to Lightning Ridge and and George was at the Anglican Church there at, at Lightning Ridge. And I said to Lou on the way home, I said, I feel like this is what Jesus wants us to be like. We need to be together somehow. But we all live so far apart. How do we make that work? Well, in one of my yarns with Isaac, um, I finally uh, got up the guts to talk to him about some of my sadness about what had happened to the Aboriginal people in Sydney. And I said, Isaac, I still feel really sad about what my people did to your people and I'm really sorry. And again, just like with Larissa Barron, I think I said sorry too much because at one stage Eileen said, Stu, you've got to stop saying sorry all the time. I said, okay. But I said, Ike, how how do we move forward? You know, we're having yarns, we're friends, we've gone out to Brewarrina and seen each other. And Isaac said, well, brother, I want to introduce you to an idea that I've got and see what you think. And what it's called is the black and white handshake. And I said, what's the black and white handshake, Ike? And he said, well, he said, brother, I think the only way our peoples can be reconciled is through Christ. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for sin. And he paid for the sin of everyone who puts their faith in him. And anyone who doesn't put their faith in him, well, they're going to have to face judgment and he will actually call them to account for the bad things they've done. So, Stu, you keep saying sorry all the time for what your people have done to my people. But he said the reality is all the sin of your people, of those of your people who are Christians, has been paid for by Jesus on the cross. And those that aren't Christians, well, they will face judgment. But we can move forward because Jesus has dealt with sin on the cross. And he's not only reconciled us to God, he's reconciled us to each other. Now, we just sang the song today, Jesus, keep me near the cross. We've just had a series at our church, Soul Revival, by the way, Soul Revival Youth Group, that went ended up going for 20 years at Glimmer Anglican Church. Sorry, I digress, but I forgot to tell you this piece of information that's important. But our, our, our youth group that went for 20 years, um, after 20 years, uh, I moved on from Guy Anglican after 40 years, actually, 20 years as a paid staff member, and our bishop, Peter Haywood, asked us if we'd plant a soul revival church so that we could see if what worked for a youth group would work for a whole church. And in 2012, we planted Soul Revival Church in Kirawi as an Anglican fellowship. And then in 2014, we became a recognised church in the Anglican Church, and I'm now the rector of that church. Uh, just uh, uh, needed to fill that information in. But in our, so what, what is lovely about the timing of this um, training day is that at our church back in uh, Kirawi, we've just done four weeks on the cross and the centrality of the cross. And for the last four weeks, we've been saying that the cross is the centre of the Christian life. And what Isaac taught me back in 2001 is that the cross is the centre of the Christian life for us personally, for our churches, 
but also for our peoples. Because what stops us going to the movies just with a few friends and ignoring everyone else? It's the cross. See, when Matthew 22, 37, 40, when Jesus says, love God and love your neighbours, he's teaching us what love is. He says, put God first and then you'll start to see everyone, not just your close friends. And what Jesus does on the cross is not only do we see everyone, but when we put our faith in Jesus, we become brothers and sisters with everyone who has put their faith in Jesus. So not only has sin been dealt with on the cross, but the cross actually gives us the opportunity to be a family. And we just sang about that. Jesus, keep me near the cross. What I want to say today is what I've learned from Isaac is that I think putting the cross at the, in the centre of our Christian life, in the centre of our churches, helps us to see everybody as our neighbour. Now, briefly this morning, um, this is uh, in preparation for the next talk, because in the next talk what I'd like to do is talk about some practical things that I've learnt from Isaac's ministry about how the reconciliation through the cross can actually help our two peoples come together. But briefly before I do, what I'd like to do is just draw our attention to three letters of Paul briefly. In the books of Romans, Ephesians and Colossians, what we see are three really clear um, examples of how the cross is at the centre of our life. The book of Romans is Paul's greatest exploration of the gospel and it's his summary of the gospel. And in chapter 1 to 11, he teaches us about the gospel and then in chapter 12 and following, he teaches us how to live out the gospel. Ephesians is a summary of Romans. And in the first half of Ephesians, he summarises the gospel. And in the second half of Ephesians, he teaches us how to love as a result of the gospel. Colossians is a summary of Ephesians. And the reading we have today from Colossians uh, is the second part of Colossians because Colossians has the same framework. The first half of Colossians teaches us about the gospel and the second half teaches us how to live it out. I want to briefly show you this morning that in Romans, Ephesians and Colossians, what Paul shows us is that the cross is the centre of the gospel story and it informs how we live. Um, if I was to turn this morning to Romans 5, would you turn there with me briefly? In Romans 5 verse 6, this is what Paul says about the cross. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. See, the cross is the, is the centre of of the gospel explanation that Paul has in Romans. And if I was to turn to Ephesians, you can see Paul having the same message, although in a briefer explanation. And that leads to how we are to live. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, talking about the consequence of the cross, this is what Paul says. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. You were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and in all. But to each of us, the grace has been given. Christ is a portion. This is why we say he ascended on high, took many captives and gave gift to his people. Down in verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers to equip his people for service as the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity and faith in the knowledge of the Son and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of fullness of Christ. See, in Ephesians 4, Paul starts by calling himself 
a prisoner of the Lord. That's a bit of a strange thing to say, isn't it? And he's urging us to live a life worthy. But if we were to flick back to Romans chapter 12, we'd hear Paul in chapter 12 in light of the gospel saying, um, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So here we are in Romans 12, seeing that Christ sacrificed himself on the cross, then we are to live as living sacrifices. That we are freed from sin and no longer prisoners to sin in Ephesians 4, so let's be prisoners to the Lord. In other words, if we repent of our sin, turn away from our past and ask for forgiveness and put our faith in Jesus, through the cross we have the power of a fresh start. And the new life is that we live in a body that is beautiful and multifaceted and is there for all of us. So if we have that message from Romans and Ephesians, what do we learn from Colossians? Now we're going to spend some more time in Colossians in my second talk. But interestingly there in chapter 3 verse 1, at the turning point of Colossians, where Paul has already taught taught the gospel in chapters 1 and 2, and now he's talking about the life in Christ in 3 and onwards, he says this, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. See, in Romans chapter 12, he says, in view of God's mercy that Jesus died on the cross for you, be a living sacrifice for him. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, be a prisoner for Christ and live for him. Here in Colossians verse th- uh, chapter, chapter 3, he's saying, you've been raised by Christ, set your, things, your hearts on things above, for you have died. You know, in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14, It says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. You see, so we've died to our old way of thinking and we need to think differently. And this training day is about that. It's about, yes, we've experienced relationships in the past that have had all sorts of different characteristics. But when we set our minds, sorry, our hearts on things above where Christ is, it's what John was saying today. If we have a heart change that Christ has given us forgiveness for our sins and we're so thankful and we put God first, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter Sorry, 22. I'm having trouble hearing you. <laughs> in chapter 22, that was my Siri on my phone saying couldn't, she couldn't hear me. But if we, if, we, <laughs> if we put the cross at the centre of our life and know that Jesus' death has reconciled us to God and to each other, then we set our hearts on things above and we think big things. We imagine new possibilities. When I met Isaac, he said, why don't you come out to Brewarrina? And after I'd gone to Brewarrina, he said, why don't we restart the river conventions, which I'm going to tell you about in the second talk. And I said, what's a river convention? To finish this talk, I want to just describe to you the first time that I took some of my mob out to be with Isaac's mob. I came home from Brewarrina glowing. I hadn't felt the same since I was in Narendra. I'd met the Fergusons, I'd met Isaac, I'd met Philly, and I'd met Isaac's mum. I'd, I'd seen the community at Brewarrina. And when I came back, I said to everyone, we've been invited by Isaac at Easter to all go up and celebrate Easter together. Isaac calls it a river convention. And so 80 of us from Guaymi Anglican Church, young and old, most of the teenagers who came along and the young adults weren't even Christians three years before. 80% of us had come from non-church backgrounds and come to Christ and were trying to work out what it looked like to be Christian in such a diverse group of people. But then we were invited by Isaac to come out and spend a weekend with his mob out at Brewarrina. And we drove out, 80 of us, and you know where we camped? On the Darling River. And I hadn't swum in a river since 1979. And I got to that campsite and as everybody else was setting up, the first thing I did was take my shoes off and my socks off and I took my shirt off and in my shorts I struggled down the muddy bank of the Darling River into a muddier looking river than the Murrumbidgee, I've got to admit. 
but it looked gorgeous. And as I swam out into the middle of that river, a flock of black cockatoos flew over the top. And I know this sounds strange. I'd driven 10 hours away from the Sutherland Shire that I'd spent most of my life, but I felt like I was at home. And it wasn't because I was necessarily swimming in fresh water again, but I was swimming with my Aboriginal brothers and sisters and my white brothers and sisters again. And I would like us today to really have a good think about how can we swim together? How can we do this together again? How can we look to creating spaces in our local churches where we can swim together? And that's the topic that I'll take up in the second session. Hi, Stu. Uh, our sheets have uh, and discussion groups after this, but we've kind of eaten into uh, morning tea time. Uh, I'm wondering if you want to set us a question to the, over morning tea. So as you'll head out the side there very shortly, uh, there's tea and coffee set up. It's all boiling, is it, Bernard? Yeah. Well, will be. Yep, so grab that. We're back here at uh, 12 o'clock for Stu's next session. Mm -hmm. But is there a question or two that you really want us to think about together yeah, as good. we do that? Yeah, my question is a simple one. When you go to church, is when, when you go to church, is it a bit like going to the movies where you just hang out with people who are like you? Or is it an opportunity to be with a lot of people who are really different? Because what I think would be good to talk about in the next session is if our churches are a bit homogeneous, in other words, they're like, they're all the same, how can we become a bit more heterogeneous and diverse? So ask that question. Are, are your, is your church fairly like going to the movies? With you, you get that analogy, by the way? You get that going to the movies thing? Because, yeah, uh, I go to the movies just with my mates. I don't want to do that anymore as a Christian. I want to be with everyone in the room. It's almost like I want to stand up halfway through the movie and say, hey, how's hey, it all going? What's happening? Any Samaritans here? <laughs> no, that's the kind of deal. So, yeah, have a, have a talk about that over, um, over coffee and tea. Like, yeah, is your space with your church just everyone's the same? Okay. okay. Uh, Bernard. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, one of the great things about today is we're together and we get a chance to talk about some of these things and the stuff Stu and Jum has raised with us. So don't waste the time that you have uh, grabbing a cuppa. Get to know some other people. Um, go straight to Stu's. Once you've worked that out, go straight to Stu's questions. So... It's there. Um, don't let people off the hook with it, but please head out.